this conference and for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about the Segway tool that we've been developing over the last, last few years. And this is a tool for dealing with um, genomic signal data. So this is the sort of data that you often find from epigenomic experiments, things like ChIP-seq or DNA-seq, ATAC-seq, even, even things like RNA-seq, where you have um, a genome established and you have a signal with a number for every position in the genome. And Segway is a way of finding patterns across multiple signals that are assigned to different places in the genome. So the way Segway works is it discovers patterns in, the, in these signals, and I'm going to show you about the implementation in a second. And then you can annotate the genome with those patterns, so you can find the pattern that best fits every location in the genome. You can visualize really complex multivariate data, so you might have you know, hundreds of these signal tracks, and you can boil it down to, to one pattern for every position in the genome. And then once you have those patterns, you can also use them to interpret things such as, um, in this case, uh, the meaning of various non-coding variants. So we call this a semi-automated annotation approach, and I'm going to go a little bit later, I'll talk about what's semi-automated about it. But the way this is implemented is through a genomic segmentation task. And I'll show you a little toy example of how this works here. So here we have a little section of a chromosome, right? Along the x-axis here, we have position in the genome, and we have three different signal tracks. Right? The y-axis for each one of the signal tracks is a, it's a function of the number of cells within some population that has some property we're interested in. Okay, so if this is a chip-seq track, and we do chip for some histone modification, if this, this number here is, is bigger, if the signal is higher, that means generally that more of the cells within, within some population um, are, have that particular histone modification, or more of them have open chromatin at some, some location, or more of them have an RNA uh, that's expressed that matches this particular genome location. So what we do in genomic segmentation is we partition the genome into non-overlapping segments, and we assign each segment a label from a finite set, and then we push around the um, boundaries of the segments, change the identities of the labels so we can maximize the similarity between segments with the same labels. Okay, so here we can see we have this zero case where we have a high, a low high, low pattern. There's a one case with a high low high pattern, the two case with a low high high pattern, and so on. And it's important to realize that you know the Segway implementation, we do all of this with real numbers, so you can actually recognize medium high, medium low, medium patterns, you know, any, anything that can be represented by a Gaussian, which is what we, what we use um, here. So I'm going to show you a brief example of how we actually use Segway to analyze 49 different data sets as part of the ENCODE project. So we had 49 different data sets or signal tracks defined for every position in the genome. Most of these are ChIP-seq data sets for various transcription factors or histone modifications. Some of them are things like DNA, which is a measurement of open chromatin. And we told Segway that we wanted it to find 25 different patterns or 25 different labels um, within this, this data. So picking the number of labels is, is important in that it, it, rec it represents essentially a trade-off between the different sorts of behavior you can pick up um, and how easy it will be for a human to interpret the results in the end. So since we want it to be relatively easy to interpret, we pick a smaller, smaller number of labels. Okay, so we have these 25 labels, and then Segway, we can run it. It, it uses a dynamic Bayesian network, which you can think of as a generalization of a hidden Markov model. And if you're interested in more details of that, I can show you on the, the poster during lunch today. Um, but essentially what it involves is a Gaussian that is learned for every combination of these 49 input tracks times each one of these 25 labels that are learned in an unsupervised fashion. Okay. So we have this heat map that shows all 25 times 49 of these Gaussians. Within each row, the reddest value indicates the, the Gaussian with the highest mean. The blue indicates the, the value with the lowest mean. Okay. And you can see that already just by learning these, these parameters across 
part of the genome, and if you hierarchically cluster them, you can already see some amount of, of structure and what was learned here in an entirely unsupervised way. Okay, so for example, you can see there's this section where there's a lot more blue, this section where there's a lot more red. Um, you know, you can see some things where there are lots of, lots of these um, transcription factors have high values here, but that's something that you see less over here. Uh, you know, then the question is, you know, what, what do you do with this? Um, so I mentioned it was semi-automated annotation. The, this, the fully automated part is up to here where you get this. This is just what comes out of your data. And the semi part means that you, you need to find a biologist to interpret your results for you. Okay, so change these 0 through 24 into something that is meaningful. Okay, well, in this case, the biologist is me. I'm a biologist. I'm not a pipettist, but I'm a biologist. And I interpret, interpreted this with my, my knowledge of chromatin biology. So I made, essentially, each of these labels into hypoth hypotheses um, that these that this say represent something about transcription start sites and then you can go back and you can check these hypotheses either in aggregate across the genome um, you spot check in individual locations and if you've ever seen any of these sort of chromatin state analyses like this one which was done as part of encode or similar things people do as part of red roadmap epigenomics that's basically how how these labels came about we do an unsupervised analysis we use them to develop hypotheses, and then we test the hypotheses. So the hypotheses here represent things like transcription start sites, five prime ends of genes, middles of genes, gene ends, um, and also some, some non-coding regions that people are uh, interested in. So things like distal enhancers, distal CTCF elements, um, polycomb repressed regions of the genome. Uh, and finally, um, these dead regions of the genome. So these are regions where we had um, very little signal in all of, all of these different assays for some cell type. These regions change from cell type to cell type, so it's not something that's an artifact of the, the sequencing, it's cell type specific. And this is the sort of thing that you would never, never you know, pick out if you're doing some sort of supervised analysis where you, you know, only looking for specific things of, of interest. It shows the power of an unsupervised analysis to actually find novel things, but you have to know enough about the biology in order to uh, interpret this. So we found these dead regions. I should mention, though, if you look, look in the ENCODE papers for dead, uh, dead regions, you will not find them because people did not like the term dead. So they are now called quiescent. So just keep that, keep that in mind. Okay. So after learning these parameters, you can then apply them back to the genome, and you can assign a label for every position in the genome. Okay. So I'll show a small segment of the genome here. Um, so this is 5 kb of the genome. There are six different signal tracks out of the several that were used to learn here. And so you can see for these histone tracks, you can see what looks like a well-positioned nucleosome on either side of a region of chromatin, which is between two genes with a bidirectional promoter. And up here, you can see the segue labeling uh, uh, for that region of the genome. So segue calls this this open chromatin region regulatory, uh, which in this particular case means things, you know, you find it at TSSs and also enhancers. On either side of it, there are things that cause TSS flanking and things that cause promoter flanking and so on and so forth. Um, you know, if you zoom out and look at a much broader region of the genome and use a different um, way of visualizing the results that we have all 25 of the labels here with thin bars and thick bars at every position um, where that label is actually found, um, you can find this pattern of transcription start site, gene start, then gene end, and it tends to occur right along where genes actually, actually are. So this is essentially a confirmation of the hypothesis that, that I made a few slides ago. Um, it's important to realize that this, this model, you know, it learns an emission model that I showed you. It also learns a transition model that, you know, says it has a prior belief that this precedes this and that precedes that. Uh, this is all stuff that it rediscovered without using anything that people used before to discover genes. So there was no, 
um, RNA data, no comparative data, no sequence data at all. It's all things that you can discover based on this signal data for, the, for epigenomics. So if we zoom out in the same region 10 times, you can find these regions occur mainly near five primates of genes, um, and you find repressed and dead segments more in these, these gene, segment, gene deserts. So this, is, again, is the, the process of uh, confirmation uh, that you need to go through. So we were, you know, it's always good, you know, whether you're, you know, you work in microscopy or whether you work in bioinformatics, it's always good to go around and, and spot check individual positions because you will miss things that, that you will, sorry, if you just look at things in aggregate, if you always look at the average of things across the genome, you will perhaps miss a few nuances that are important. So this is, this is an example of of uh, something that we wouldn't see except for the fact that we did randomly click around the genome and looked at various positions. So there are lots of genes, but very few of these segments. Okay, that's because those other genes are not expressed in the cell type. So you know, for the particular case of discovering genes, it's only the genes that are active in the cell type for, for which we use the epigenomic data here uh, that we discover. So we decided to do some uh, wet lab experiments in order to see whether, um, whether these particular sequences, particular regions identified by Segway from the epigenomic data as having TSS properties were sufficient in and of themselves to drive, um, to drive transcription activity. Okay, so we took a number of segments uh, smaller than 1,000 base pairs around TSSs that had been annotated, okay, and then we divided them into ones that had been annotated by Segway as transcription start sites in the cell type and those that hadn't. And then we did some transient transfection lab, ex uh, lab experiments to do this. And I say we, as I mentioned, I, I am not a pipettist, so I don't actually use pipettes myself, so we got a external service provider to do this, so we hired them, and they did this wet lab experiment for us, and then we were able to use that to understand biology. Um, so here you can see the results of this experiment. So, so we did 96 um, different uh, positive examples and then a number of negative examples. Every single one of the positive examples, uh, the predictions showed up with transcription activity. Uh, most of the negative examples uh, did not have transcription activity, although a number of them them did. So in those cases, the sequence is, you know, since they're all around TSSs, um, you know, in the positive cases, it's enough to drive transcription. In the negative cases, um, it's not necessarily enough to repress in that cell type. So there's something else nearby, probably, that is causing the repression of the sequences in this particular cell type. Um, since we're running a little short on time, I thought I would sum up at this point. Uh, but you know, I'll have the poster downstairs so I can talk a lot more about many other things like our semi-supervised mode um, or the implementation or, or whatever else. But semi-automated semi genome annotation uh, begins with pattern discovery and we can use it to annotate the genome and to visualize very complex data in a simple way and also to interpret the, the genome. Um, all of the software that I've used here um, is available for free on our, our lab website. It's all um, GPL-based. Um, thank you to a uh, reviewer of this abstract who pointed out that it is not actually mentioned on the website that is GPL-based, but uh, it is available on the GPL, and that is now mentioned on our website, so thank you. Um, you can download our software here. Uh, there's a full-time programmer working on Segway who has done a lot of work uh, since he started mainly to make it easier to deploy Segway and its uh, um, dependencies, which I'm sure any of you who develop software know can be a huge headache and is now working on, on other features. Um, SegTools is what we use to make some of these plots from that sort of uh, data type. And we've got a lot of you know, interesting um, advances to the tools planned over the, the next year or so. Um, so we want to get rid of some of the semi-automated aspect. We're developing a pipeline that will essentially make this fully automated if you want to do the sort of chromatin analysis that I've talked about here. But of course, you can continue to use this for any sort of um, data 
that you can define along the genome in this way. So using it for RNA data is another area that we are exploring, and of course, it will take some time before it's mature enough to develop a fully automated pipeline in that regard. Uh, so I want to thank the people in my lab. I want to thank a number of people who have, who have helped with various parts of this project, uh, the ENCODE project for supplying all of this wonderful data that, that has made all of this possible. Uh, and finally, I want to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you.